All right. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to take it slow just in case some people might still want to come in. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what is a static partitioning, um, something you might, you probably are all familiar with. Um, so the idea is that on a modern SOC, there is so much hardware that it's difficult to manage it all from a single system. Uh, you want to di divide it up into different domains, into different partitions, and run different systems on different partitions. Now, in this example, for instance, this is Axalin's Ultrascale Plus MPSOC. Um, it's a block diagram of it. Um, as you can see, there is a lot of stuff in it. Uh, four fully powered A53 cores, um, a bunch of programmable logic, a number of peripherals, a graphic processor, and much more. Um, this is, you know, from Xilinx, but if you look at the block diagrams of other SOC vendors, you see something, you know, comparable. Um, so the point is, what do we do with so much hardware, with so much stuff? Um, so ideally, what we would like to do is to, uh, you know, draw circles, nice circles around the block that you want to use, uh, and um, use them for, for, with Linux, with a certain OS, uh, with whatever you like, with a special setup to, to make use of these hardware resources, and then draw a different diagram, a different, a different uh, circle around a different set of resources, and do something differently there. So in this almost random example, I draw a red circle around a couple of the uh, A53 cores, uh, some memory uh, here, and uh, whoops, uh, and the PCIe controller, and I draw red circles around the other two A53 cores, some more memory, and a bunch of programmable logic underneath. So again, the idea is, uh, Yes, there is enough hardware so that you can run independently everything that you need separately. So you don't really need to cram everything together on a single system anymore. Um, so why? Uh, why is desirable to uh, statically partition the system that way? So there are a number of reasons. Uh, I'm going to go through the, the top ones, or the one I am aware of, uh, but I think Mixed criticality is really the chief concept to understand. So typically, in most people across the industry, and there was a very nice talk earlier on from the BMW, from the, saying, you know, each industry is actually quite different. And that is very true. Uh, I find, though, there are some commonalities ac across industries. And what, one that is common across many is mixed criticality, meaning that there is often something that is very critical that you want to run, and something that is far less critical. Obviously, different industries can have very different examples of this. So I've seen, for instance, in avionics, the critical application is the piloting software for your drone, and the non-critical ap application is the control path. Um, in automotive, the critical application could be uh, the software that takes as an input the rear view camera stream that you look at when, you back, when you're back, backing out, and the non-critical could be just the UI. Um, in industrial, uh, the critical component could be the software that is uh, controlling the robotic arm, and the non-critical software could be the user interface, uh, something connected to the internet, doing statistics, and things like that. Um, so in all these scenarios, the critical and the non-critical software is desirable for them to coexist on the single board because as we have, as we have seen, you know, at least this board, I'm sure many others, have definitely enough hardware to run them both. But these are two completely different environments, uh, developed differently. Um, even if they are the same, let's say they are both Linux, typically the critical is not Linux. But even if it was Linux, there would be different kernels developed differently, different update schedules, different providers. One might be R uh, an RT Linux kernel, the other one might not be an RT Linux kernel. So very, very different environments. With static partitioning, you can run both of them together, but independently on different domains on your, on your SOC. Um, that brings me to the next topic, which is safety. So the critical application has often, not always, but often uh, some safety requirements. Uh, so in the industrial case, 
um, if the critical application fails to control the robotic arm properly, the robotic arm might swing around and hit some, some of the worker, right? So there, are, there is actually often a safety concern related to people, and when that is the case, there are certifications involved, which is uh, a very big topic, of course. So in these cases, the applications that are safety, a safety uh, requirement definitely is a great idea to keep it separate from the one that has non, that's non-safety critical, because uh, the last thing you want is a non-safety critical environment to compromise, to affect in any way your safety environment. And that goes across the board. It's not just security, but it's also isolation of the performance level. So the non-critical application should not be able to affect the performance of the critical application in any way, in both in terms of CPU, but also in terms of RQ latency and everything else. Security, like obviously, like. Critical and non-critical application typically have very different security update schedules. Uh, different, they might be developed on, on different OSs. They might just have different security policies. Real time, the critical application almost always has real, some, some sort of real time requirements, uh, some RQ latency requirements, uh, and even non-safety um, critical app often have some real uh, RQ latency requirements that need to be respected. Uh, by partitioning the system, splitting it up cleanly, you can guarantee these uh, real-time requirements, um, even if one of the two systems have not, has not really been developed against any real-time uh, properties. Fault isolation. Um, so almost always, in my experience, with what I've seen, one of the first four points typically applies. But even if none of them apply, it's still a good, see, see, it's a, it's a good software development policy to not put all your eggs in one basket, right? So, so to, to separate the application in a way that they are only run with the least amount of privilege to do their job. And so that if they crash, the only thing that is compromised is the functionality of that application, not the whole system. Um, so if you do static partitioning, you can develop a system that works exactly like that. So each partition is separate, is isolated, and uh, each application is only privileged enough to do its own thing. Its partition allows it only to do one thing, and if it crashes, the crash is contained within the partition. Multiple OSs, well, well that's the simplest of them all. If you have more than one OS, obviously, typically you need to run them in separate partitions. So how do we, uh, how do we deploy or develop or, uh, a static partitioning solution? So the goal here is um, what I've tried to achieve is to use Zen to set up a static partitioning environment. Now, this looks good on paper because uh, Xen is a type 1 hypervisor, actually following from the previous talk, is a microkernel, in fact. Uh, so it, it, uh, it's very small. It starts on the highest privilege level, so it should have, it does have the capability to set up all the system, uh, the whole system with uh, each domain, the right amount of privilege that it needs, and dedicated CPU cores, dedicated memory, dedicated hardware resources, uh, guaranteed RQ latency the way needed, uh, just as I, as I explained, in theory. In practice, is not quite like that. It's, it's close, but not quite, quite as, as good. Um, why? Because, yes, Xen is definitely running in the highest privilege mode. It starts first, so it should be able to do all the partitioning the way we like. But in practice, the way it has been used so far all these years is to start DOM0 first. What is this DOM0? DOM0 is a special VM, which is typically Linux. Um, which is privileged. So it, you can do privileged operation from it, like starting other VMs, stopping other VMs, doing all sorts of stuff, rebooting the whole machine, and so on. Now, what, what does it mean? First of all, well, it means a number of things. So, so you could still set up your system from DOM0, but it doesn't look quite as good as this, does it? And, and also, there are actual concrete consequences of having DOM0. So this is a, a list, non-comprehensive list of consequences of having DOM0. So 
One consequence is simply, well, let's start from the easy one. You have one more partition in your system, right? So if you don't need, if you don't need a Linux system, why should you, right? This is one more partition that is using resources. If nothing else, is going to use power, right? So you don't need that. Secondly, this is privileged. So you have, one has to be very careful what it puts in DOM0 because, well, DOM0 has pretty much the keys to the castle, right? So you cannot really put your, you know, uh, you know the least privileged application in DOM0. It wouldn't be a good idea. There are other consequences. I think the worst one is probably the boot time. Let's say that what you care about is your critical application uh, that you want to put in, ye in the yellow domain, the yellow partition or yellow VM, how you want to call it. So what you care about is the startup time of your yellow app. So wisdom zero in the system, uh, you have to boot Xen. Well, that's small and, and quick, fine. But then you need to boot the DOM0 kernel, which again typically is Linux. The DOM0 user space, all of it. And then finally you have the Excel tool available to start your yellow VM. That means your boot time, if you don't start doing some optimization, some really good optimization on your DOM0, on your DOM0 system, is going to be bigger than three seconds. It's fair to say bigger than five seconds. I think by default it's going to be even bigger than 10 seconds if you don't start cutting any system and so on, right? This is not what you want for your swinging robotic arm controller, right? Um, that would be 10 seconds of panic there. Um, so there are other consequences, safety certification. So Linux is, is large. Uh, is a bit still problematic certifying a Linux system. So what do you do for DOM0? There isn't a simple answer. You could replace it with another OS. So nothing, nothing says that DOM0 has to be Linux. Um, but then if you don't use a, a Linux as DOM0, you are both of an, a bit of a strange path. Not many other people use a non-Linux DOM0, so it becomes harder to set up, so on and so forth. You, there are other simple solutions, like one idea is simply to use DOM0 to set up the system and then quit. That means DOM0 will only be there at start at time. Okay, that may be feasible. It could be a decent workaround. Um, but we'll have a better solution just in a, in a couple of slides. Um, complexity, obviously you have one more VM to, to build, Yocto and so on. Pros, I've only been focusing on the cons so far. So there are pros in having DOM0. Well, you have one place where you can do monitoring. You can monitor your health, the health of your system. You can reboot your VM. You can do a bunch of stuff. Some of them really cool, like doing memory introspection, getting very, very, very detailed information on the behavior of your, of your VM, of the application within the VM. Really cool. So, you know, you can't have everything, right? Um, and that brings me to the solution. So what I've been working on in the last year and a half is to improve static partitioning uh, scenarios with Zen. And I, I did that by implementing a new feature that we've been calling uh, DOM0 less. Why? I'll, it will become obvious very soon. So the idea is to um, not require DOM0 to boot your system. Um, how do we achieve that goal? We achieve that goal, first of all, by having U-Boot load more things into memory than it usually does. So what does U-Boot usually load into memory? Well, it loads the Xen hypervisor, uh, obvious. It also loads the DOM0 kernel and RAM disk, also obvious. But it usually stops there. So we extended it, the protocol to also load the kernel and RAM disk of yellow, and the color, kernel and RAM disk of purple. Step one. Step two, we boot Zen as usual, but then we have Zen start in parallel all your domains on separate physical cores. So here we have DOM0, yellow, and purple, all starting in parallel. Now, that means that your yellow app here the boot time of yellow without doing any optimization is going to be less of a, than a second. Why? Because the only thing it needs to wait is for Xen to start. And Xen is pretty tiny. It's less than 50,000 lines of code. So it's not going to take long. Um, so, so it's easy to probably with some optimization, you can go into the realm of milliseconds of boot time. Um, how do we do the parallel boot thing? So, 
the idea is that when you bootstart Zen, it passes to Zen some more information telling Zen that it shouldn't just start on zero and stop there, but it should also start yellow and purple. I'm gonna go into detail of how that is done in a couple of slides. But what I want to say here is, well, I've been saying dom zero less, dom zero less, dom zero less, but that's dom zero. Yes, so, so the idea is uh, dom zero less refers to these two VMs, yellow and purple. Why? Because they have been started without any help from dom zero. So dom zero has done nothing whatsoever to help or provide any services, like nothing, zero, nada, to start yellow and purple. And that's why we call them uh, DOM zero less VMs. But you still have DOM zero there. So you can still use it to start more VMs, like in this case, a regular, your, you know, round of the meal red VM, uh, usual, uh, or do monitoring, do the usual stuff that you do from DOM zero. How does it work? Um, so this is to go, you know, this is a technical conference, so I, I wanted to go a bit more into the implementation detail. Um, so uh, the way it works is, as I said, first of all, we extend, U I mean, we ask U-Boot to load more things into memory. So here we have U-Boot um, start uh, loading into memory the device tree, that's the first line, the DOM0 kernel, the hypervisor, the DOM0 RAM disk. The last command here is to boot Zen. This is what we usually do. This is what uh, it has been done up to now. What's new is that now you, we also ask to load the kernel and RAM disk of yellow, and again, the same for purple or any of the other DOM zero less VMs. Step one. Step two, we have to tell Xen somehow that in this system, there isn't just DOM zero, but there are two more VMs. How do we do that? Device three. So we have already some DOM zero related configuration under the chosen node in device tree. So we just extended that uh, set of bindings uh, to also ac advertise the presence of more VMs. So we added a node that is compatible to Xen domain. Uh, it has some memory, some virtual CPU, a PL011 and just a UART an em uh, em emulated by Xen. And this tells then where the kernel is. The last module tells then where the RAM disk is. So this is a unit of description for one of these DOM zero less VM. Xen is gonna read it, it's gonna find out that it needs to start a VM with the kernel loaded here and the RAM disk loaded here, and it's gonna start it. Okay, so all of, all of, all of that, uh, Everything I said so far is good, and, and, but it's honestly useless without device assignment. Because, yes, you can start VMs, but there is no memory, no paravirtualized driver, nothing. What are you going to do with them, right? This is not much. So this, this becomes useful as soon as you can assign physical resources to each of these domains or static partitions. Uh, how do you do that? With device assignment. So you remap MMIU region and interrupts uh, of hard, physical hardware resources into these partitions. So in this example, the network card is given to yellow VM. How is it done? Again, with device tree. So we expose, uh, so if, you, if any of you are already familiar with Zen, today it's possible to assign devices to VMs that are started from DOM0, and it is done by adding a little device tree snippet uh, to your VM config file. We took the same idea. Uh, the idea is that this device tree snippet here describes one device that needs to be assigned to one of your domains, for instance, the network card. You compile it into its own DTB, and then you load it again from U-boot, add it to the domain uh, description, uh, and this basically tells Zen uh, that there is one device to be assigned, one or more device to be assigned. Uh, how does it work? It's pretty simple. It contains a description of the device to assign, a couple of special attributes, one with the memory region that you want to remap and the destination, and another one with the path, like the, uh, basically a link to the corresponding device on the host device tree. 
Because this way, if you're asking why there are two descriptions, is this way you, might, you can expose a different description of the device to your domain compared to the physical host device tree description. And there are cases where that is useful. All right, so that brings me to um, true DOM zero-less. So true DOM zero-less means actually there is no DOM zero, okay? Um, so in this example, uh, we have only two VMs, only two domains, yellow with the network card, and purple with a PL, like a programmable logic block. And that's definitely achievable now that we have DOM zero-less. Not done yet upstream, but definitely doable. Um, so yeah, going back to that slide, um, using DOM zero less, we can definitely set up a system where Xen starts and automatically set up all the static partitions for you according to your configuration, with each static partition having physical core fully dedicated to them, as well as um, hardware resources assigned to them. RQ latency is minimal uh, and you, CPU are fully dedicated uh, using a special scheduler called now uh, that tells them to dedicate fully cores to static partition and not do any scheduling that uh, increase RQ latency. Okay, so um, yes, the talk is about static partitioning and this is I think where this feature really shine but I wanted to just spend a couple of words to say that it can also be used for non-static partitioning cases. Like, unless you take it out, you still have DOM zero, so you can use it for stuff, right? You can, for instance, have um, a couple of more VMs, which could be, you know, driving your safety critical or your critical applications, start at a boot time to increase, the, well, to decrease, to minimize the boot time, and then as well, after the system is fully up and running, you can still use DOM0 to start non-critical stuff separately, right? Okay, pros and cons. So, with DOM0 less, you can set up a true static partitioning system, uh, you get way faster boot times, so I get easily less than a second boot times. Um, is excellent for a small system with only a few static partitions. Is way easier to certify because now you only have to, say, to safety certify the hypervisor, not DOM0. So this big chunk of the system, the software solution, goes away. Um, lower complexity. The big chunk of software solutions that goes away also means that you don't need to build it. You don't need to build a Linux system anymore, especially just to run the Xen tools. You don't need to use Yocto or anything. So to set up DOM zero less, you basically just compile Xen with the Linaro GCC, the way you do the Linux kernel, that's it. There is nothing else to build. So you just build Xen, you tell it to start two things in parallel, and that's the end. Um, what else? Well. I have a pretty big, cons for, pretty big cons for you. There is no DOM zero. Yeah, yeah, there is no DOM zero. That means if you wanna reboot your VMs, you can't. You wanna start more VMs, you can't, right? So every, everything is a, is a trade-off. So if you want to get rid of DOM zero, it means you, you have no DOM zero after all, right? Um, one thing that you should be aware of, today what is not implemented is you don't have, um, PV drivers between DOM zero less VMs. This is technically possible to have a network backend to share the network card, for instance, running in yellow, and then the front end running in purple. Technically possible, doesn't work, okay? It's on the roadmap, uh, and will be implemented at some point. So today, it can only really be used for pure static partitioning scenarios. That brings me to the uh, to-do list, and what's done and what's missing. What is done is basic DOM zero less, like starting multiple VMs in parallel. That's implemented, is upstream in Xen 412. Device assignment is in progress. We are very close to upstreaming it, and hopefully it's gonna be in, in, in 413, which will be out by the end of the year. Uh, it's also available in the Xilinx Xen tree. What's next? So true DOM zero less, meaning getting rid of DOM zero for good, you can very easily do with a one line change patch, but is not absent. You can you cannot really do it with, with just a configuration. Um, share memory at interrupt, so it's really, it's really, will be really good to be able to share memory, cacheable memory between the DOM0 SVMs and let them communicate. That's missing. 
NPV front-end and back-end is a bit farther out, but it will be done at some point. So shared memory is actually quite easy to implement. So I haven't got around to it yet. All right, so um, I have quite a few interesting demos to show you. I'm gonna start with uh, uh, this demo. Uh, so actually, first, I wanna show you something else. The first thing I wanna show you is um, I've been working on simplifying the, config the configuration even further so you don't have to manually edit your device tree, manually edit your U-Boot script. So what this does is a very, very simple te plain test config file. And there is a very, very simple script that takes this as an input and generates a U-Boot script for you that's gonna boot the entire system. Um, so this tells it you know, where the memory is, the device tree binary, that you, the device tree blob you're using, the Xen, the binary that you're using, the kernel for DOM0, the kernel, the RAMDIX for DOM0, how many other domains you have. This is a configuration for device assignment and contains a network card, and that's basically the output. So I'm gonna run it as an example for you. This generated a U-boot script. Um, if you wanna see the source, this source is basically loading a bunch of binaries into memory. It's also doing the modification of the device tree from the UBoot script itself so that all your binaries that you provided as input are pristine and unchanged. And then it's simply called boot. Uh, so I can show you how it can be, how it works, but I'm running it from QM, so this is gonna be slow. Uh, I can tell you straight ahead it's gonna be slow. The only thing you need to do is set the IP address, load the script into memory, and run it. And uh, you're gonna see a bunch of VM being started in parallel, slowly, because this is fully emulated on my laptop right now. So basically, there are three VMs all starting. The mess on the console is because all of them are printing. Um, one of them has a network card, and so on, okay. Right, so this is pretty basic DOM zero-less, so you should be able to, rep to do this on your own without too much difficulty. Uh, I wanted to show you something more interesting than this. Something more interesting is uh, the demo I wanted to talk to you about. So in this demo, there is no DOM zero. There is um, a yellow VM with a network card, which is Linux plus Busybox, so it's a very, very small Linux environment. And the other one, purple, is a bare metal app. So this is not even Linux, it's tiny, uh, it's bare metal, and has a UART directly assigned to it, the secondary UART, there are like I think two or four maybe on the ultra scale plus, more than you need, and a TTC timer, one, the, one of the many timers that are available on the board. So what I'm running on purple is just a tiny application to measure RQ latency. So I'm gonna run it now. So this is live over the internet. So if anything goes wrong, I'm gonna blame it on the internet. I'm gonna tell you straight away. Um, so here you'll see the system starting and you should be uh, able to see the first VM only. And on the other tab here, the bare metal app will start. So this is Zen, now this is, uh, the bare metal app already finished, obviously, because it's tiny. So already started, booted, run, and finished. And it ran its own RQ latency test. Um, if I go back to this, uh, we have only one domain running. Why is called domain two? This is, this is because I implemented um, through DOM zero-less for this demo with this patch, return zero there. So I just stopped then from starting DOM zero. So if you take DOM0 out, DOM1 is the one with the latency test, so DOM2 is the one left with the network card. So I'm gonna switch input here to this guy, and you can see he has a, an IP address, and I can ping the host is connected to, and it works. Okay, so that's two demos. Um, I can, show you on one more, if I can, which is uh, a pretty complex solution uh, with Xen starting three VMs, DOM0, yellow, and purple, and then from DOM0 starting one more VM, regular with front-end and back-end, 
um, with a network car so assigned to yellow. So the only one that can actually go out is yellow, and the other two can only talk to with one another. So this is basically a private network by virtue of the fact there is no internet connection there at all. Uh, this is recorded, um, and I can see so this is about to boot. So this is then starting. The three VMs started in parallel. Bit of a mess on the console. The other two have finished. Only DOM0 is left. OK, DOM0 is fully booted. I'm logging in. Now, from here, uh, uh, you, you, you can see, so I switched the input here to DOM1. So DOM1 is the one with the network card. That will be yellow in the picture. It, and it has um, an IP address assigned to it, same as in the demo I just showed you live. Uh, I'm, here, what I'm doing, I'm showing that it can ping the host. Funnily enough, I cannot show you ping Google because this is in my firewall Xilinx network, so I cannot touch you ping Google. But that's the closest to pinging the real internet that I can get into the, <laughs> in this demo. Then I switch the input to the second domain, and then back to Zen, DOM0, OK? And in DOM0, you see I can use Excel to issue commands. I start, you, you see these two null name VMs? DOM0 less VM have no name because the name is assigned from DOM0. So they come up as now. But you can see that there are, there are two of them, was one with two vCPU, the other one with only one vCPU, and both of them with 128 megabytes of, of memory. And then what I'm doing is I'm just starting one more VM. Uh, this is a config file of the VM I'm about to start. Starting the VM. OK, obviously there are three VMs now. The one called test is the one started from DOM0. And now I, I'm going to do a silly test where I write chow to index.html and use the busybox implementation of HTTPD running here. Uh, and then there is no network interface because I'm using a special para-virtualized network, networking called PVCalls that doesn't create the network interface. Uh, and then from DOM0, I'm going to fetch. I'm going to fetch the index.html page from localhost. That's because this localhost is this communication domain between all VMs in DOM0 using this special PV call paravirtualized interface. And you can see there is chow written in the page. So basically, I can sh you can see that they communicate as usual as you could do without DOM0 less. And still, the network is completely separate because we assign the network card to the other domain. OK, that, that's the end. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer any. Yes. Yes. So typically, DOM0 is the one that, uh, in, in a traditional setup, DOM0 is the one that has all devices, and then, or almost all, except for the one that is directly assigned to others. And then you, um, part of, you start these par virtualized backends in DOM0 and the front end in other VMs. So here, all of that stuff is still architecturally present in Zen. So you could do it. Um, and the idea is that one day, you could do this, all right? This, this thing doesn't quite work. So you could start yellow with a network card, but also the network backend, as typically is done in DOM0, so that another VM can actually connect to it. And in fact, part of this protocol, there is already a rendezvous mechanism that is based on status, you know, check when the other guy is online. So it will work with parallel boot, too. It's just that the plumbing is not done yet. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 
Yeah? Yeah, so the, when I say bare metal, for instance, that's not a proprietary. So bare metal is what Xilin calls uh, this tiny, tiny little library OS. It's not even an OS. It's just a set of library functions to initialize your bare metal hardware that can also be run in a VM. But we are talking about a kernel plus app that is maybe less than 100 kilobytes. Like it's a tiny, tiny application. And that's definitely not Linux. Uh, and um, this is what you have seen starting with the RQ latency test. Right? That's a completely separate kernel that has been run uh, in parallel. Yeah. Yeah. So keep in mind that I have far better number that I can tell you about. Um, so. So RQ latency is a big topic. I, I could talk about RQ latency for an entire presentation, and I plan to do that next year. But <laughs> I mean, I can, I, can, I can explain. So RQ latency is a key to have in low is to fully dedicate CPUs so that you don't do scheduling, descheduling. OK, That's, you can do it by default by using sched equal null on the send command line. That means each virtual CPU is going to be one-to-one -one mapped to a physical core. Now, that works if you have a system with no interference and you get to already this pretty good number. Like, if you look, look this one has a high latency. So the biggest latency in this test is 3.7 microseconds. This is pretty good for an ARM system, I'm telling you. Like, it's, it's very hard to beat that. However, the key is on a system without interference. So there are still ways on ARM systems to create, to cause interference between core and affect the performance from uh, one core to another. But we are close to publishing a set of changes to Xen that basically like zero the possibility of interference uh, by separating the cache of each processor. Uh, and I, we have done extremely detailed measurements of an IRQ latency, and even in the worst possible case with the worst possible kind of interference is always less than five microseconds. So I feel extremely comfortable on the IRQ latency side, but you need those changes, not published yet, about to be. So, so it's, it's not, it's not, it's not uh, separate that way. So, so it's only that each VM has um, dedicated cache line. That's a good way of putting it. So that way you, don't not, you're, you have no chance of a VM affecting cache line performance of another VM. But you can still share memory, and on the share memory, of course, like if you share a page, that one can be affected, that one page, rather, of course. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. So, well, yes and no. So the code is all open source, and I'm sure you can find it somewhere on the Xilinx uh, GitHub page. In practice, so the classic way of building it is through Vivado, which is a pretty big SDK from Xilinx that comes with the product. Uh, so and Vivado itself is not open source. But all the libraries is all BSD licensed. So you, it's, it's, you can... In theory, you could build it, but I did it before, build it by hand outside of Vivado, and that would be completely open source, yeah. Can you Absolutely. I, I know that people, for instance, have took it and slightly modified it and used it on a Renaissance board, for instance. Um, so it, it can be done. Yeah. So Lars is going to have a presentation tomorrow and uh, is going to talk about it. There are, we have a lot of thoughts on that area, so we made some progress this year, specifically on certification. We've been talking about it for a while, and we recognize it's key for the Xenai hypervisor to make forward progress. So check out Lars' talk tomorrow. Yeah. So Xen uh, supports x86 and ARM. Uh, ARM32 and ARM64, actually. Um, our, um, however, DOM0 only, is only implemented on ARM. 
So you cannot use DOM0 less on x86. What you could do on x86, so you could have DOM0 start the other VMs and quit. And you can get actually close, not quite as good as, but close in terms of like startup time, for instance. And that you could do it to today. Last questions? No, I'm the only thing standing between me and refreshment, and okay. So, yeah, I guess the question. So the key is it needs to be protected with the SMMU. So, uh, and then automatically we'll use the SMMU to protect every device assignment in the system if the SMMU is available. Uh, on Ultrascape Plus is available. There are a few other boards with a good SMMU implementation. That's definitely something to look at uh, when you look at this solution because if the SMMU is not there or it doesn't quite work, then it becomes a bit difficult, yeah. Okay, thank you all and uh, have a good rest of the evening.